Welcome to Arise Life, a community of believers being equipped, empowered, and released into their destiny. For more information, go to arisealife.org or follow us on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram. Hmm. Let's just pray. Father, we're not where we want to be. We're not where you want us to be. But you will take us to where you want us to be. So God, we're letting go of where we are. We're letting go of where we thought we were where we thought we wanted to be. We're saying better to be a doorkeeper in the house of the Lord than to have whatever I thought I wanted. And I've chosen to delight myself in you, Lord, and trust you that you will meet the desires of my heart, Hmm. even if I don't know what they are. Amen. Anybody here who's been through part of this Ruth series been surprised by Ruth? Has it been a bit different? I, I, I want you to know something. If you are reading scripture and you don't see somebody with warts on them, you don't yet see the scripture. Because there are nobody is altogether lovely except Jesus. Does that make sense? And if you're le- reading a story and you can't see mess... Anybody here heard a testimony from somebody that left you depressed? Because they were so far out there, you're like, wow, I just should give up now. (laughs) Do do you know what I'm talking about? I need a testimony from people who are broken like me. And that's why I have just become transfixed by watching Naomi and Ruth and Boaz in this story. For those of you who weren't with us last week, (laughs) let me bring you up to speed. Naomi, a woman whose name means pleasure or pleasant, and we said this, who here has pursued pleasure and found yourself in a place she didn't want to be? But she could have at least blamed her husband on it. Anybody here? You ended up in a place because you blamed the person who was driving? Moving on. No nudging. And uh, her husband, whose, whose name means God is my king, didn't let God lead him and left the very house of bread in the time of a famine. Do you think you want to stay in the house of bread? Like, who here, you've been in a bad place, so you went out looking for a better place and found that the bad place was better than all the other places? No, but three of us? Man, you guys don't go. You know, I've never moved. I don't do nothing. <laughs> Well, yeah, I just settle. No, I, I mean, and so she, they leave the house of bread and go to the land of Moab, which is a place where you will do the unthinkable if just to survive. And if we are honest, every single one of us have some serious regrets that we've done in the name of survival. Who here has literally done this? I had no choice. I had to do it. I had to do it. I, I think thou dost protest too much. Oh, maybe I didn't have to do it. And then what's worse is when you see other people who had the same opportunities as you make different decisions. Uh, maybe I didn't. It's, isn't that a scary place? What are the feelings you feel when you realize that maybe you didn't have to do it? Maybe the narrative I've been telling myself is not true. All my fault? Yeah, all my fault? Shame? Despair? Disappointment. Disappointment? Come on. I hate? Hate myself? Hate everybody else? Blame? Who are my blame shifters? Sam, 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 Sam. And all of a sudden, it all comes back to rest on you. And I just look at Naomi, how much courage it took for her to go back from the land of Moab to go back to Israel with no plan B. She was out of plans. And Ruth goes with her, right? Friendship. Friendship. 
one of the biggest reasons we one of the biggest reasons we're not overcoming in areas of our lives is because we're doing it alone. Adam was perfect, but alone. And God said, it's not good. You ain't perfect. <laughs> I ain't perfect. We are not meant to do this alone. You know, it said, where two or three are gathered, there I, God, Jesus, am in their midst. Yeah. When I'm by myself, is he in my midst? <laughs> He's in me. But you know what? I need him outside of me in my world. I need him in my midst. Yeah. I need him. And who here, by yourself, you can lose God? Come on. Oh, Peter, where are you? I don't know. <laughs> I've lost myself. And all it takes is for me to look into the mirror of you to remind me who I am. Mm -hmm. Come on. Come on. Do you have people in your life who have the same not identical, but many of the same values as you do for, 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 the, for God, for what you're going after. Now, here's the deal. Nobody's going to have all the same stuff as you. Does that make sense? Yeah. Why? Because you're unique. God, if God wanted you, he'd just copy, uh, copy and paste. He didn't do that. He wants you. So that means for all the parts of who God made me, I need tons of people to show me me. Mm -hmm. The parts of me because see, Masha, Masha is an amazing mirror. She's a very good looking mirror. She makes me look good. I'm like, dang, I want to be who you see me as. But do you know what? She is a horrible man. I mean, just the worst man you could imagine. She, she fundamentally fails as a man. And I'm glad for that. That's why I need brothers who show me parts of me that Masha never could. Naomi has forgotten God. Naomi is convinced that God has been mean to her. Who are my people? You have a part of your story where God's been mean to me. And you want to take him to the principal, but he's the principal. Right? You're like, where do, can I speak to your supervisor, God? I am disappointed in the level of service I've been receiving. The program I signed up for, this was not it. Now I'm going to push a little bit. I'm going to push. Because see, you've got to be honest. If you've been raised in religion, you can't say what I just said. Does that make sense? Because you're like, I know, I know he's good. I know he's good. He scares me. He's good. I think he's out to get me. He's good. <laughs> right? You know what I'm talking about? Okay. So, so this is a safe place. This is a safe space. Right? But you have to be honest with what you think he did to you so that he can confront the story you tell yourself. When you're like, I don't have a problem. I don't have a problem. I don't have a problem. I saw a picture of a little girl. The mom said... Honey, what, can you tell me about the chocolate that's on your face? I ate fettuccine. And my mouth was dirty. So I washed it with chocolate. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Until you tell the story, he can't confront it. Till we're honest with the stories we tell ourselves, he can't speak the truth. And it's scary, isn't it? Until she, she, Naomi, living in Moab, could believe all the lies until she went back to Israel. Remember? She goes, God's been mean to me. God's been bad to me. And she, but she only really said it out loud when she got back to Israel. When everybody's like, oh, Naomi. <laughs> But do you know, Ruth is the one who saw Naomi's God. She said, I want your God. Naomi's like, I don't want my God. Ruth's like, I want your God. 
And, and it's interesting, Naomi says, she calls out Ruth's kindness to her. And we talked about this word. We talked about this word, hesed. Hesed is translated as loving kindness, or just kindness, or grace. Hesed, I don't deserve this, but you are so good to me. She's saying to this Moabite woman, I don't deserve you. Thank you. They come back and, you know, Ruth, we've talked through this. Naomi is not doing anything, but Ruth, listen, just because someone in your life has become completely passive and is totally stuck in their depression and despair is not an excuse for you to go there too. Come on. Uh, okay. Who are my people? When the person that I am connected to, maybe it's a part business partner, maybe it's an office mate, maybe it's a, a parent or a spouse or a child, the person I'm connected to loses Jesus. I get ticked off. You don't get ticked off. I get mad. I get mad. I'm like, no, no, no. You are sinking my boat. <laughs> Quit rocking my boat. Nobody. Wow. Okay. Like, because their choices affect me, right? And God can't bless me with you in my boat. Nobody? Okay, now we're getting real. All right, I see the stickers. People are like, that was way too real. Yeah, no, no, because God is so powerless, he cannot bless me, he can't empower me, because your choices disempower me. Is God so powerless? Listen, if people take away your choices, God can give you new choices. But you got to surrender the old choices, the disappointment, to get new choices. He's a creative God. He's like, listen, you guys watch like every time he hits water, he does something different. He's like, Red Sea. Oh, let me think here. Oh, parting with a staff. Let's do that. Oh, oh, not even a staff. Just talk. Okay. Oh, we're going. Next time they come to a river and he goes, hmm, when your feet touch the water, then it parts. Yeah. Then Elijah and Elisha, Elijah's like, watch this. Shing! Takes his robe and swacks the water and bam, walk right on through, right? And Jesus is like, forget that. Let's just walk. <laughs> oh, like, uh, listen, God is so creative. He's never created a person twice. Listen, you have issues in your life. God's not like, oh, well, that's it. You made that choice. It's over. I'm out of options. Yeah. I thought I was creative, but apparently not. <laughs> But again, I believe that may be for me, but I don't believe it for you. Sorry, that got too real. Moving on, right? Because you take away my choices. I, I was going to be... Okay. okay, I was a very ornery, on-fire teenager. And the number of times I blamed my parents for not allowing me to be obedient to Jesus. <gasps> I would have been obedient to Jesus, but you took away my options. <laughs> now I will embrace self-righteous indignation and pride and arrogance for Jesus. So their sin is an excuse for your sin. Perfect. Like that. Ruth doesn't do that. Ruth goes and she's, you know, she gets out there. She's gathering grain, working like a dog for, for two months with really no thankfulness, except like, wow. And they have this moment, Naomi comes up with this idea, I need to look out for you, honey child. Now we talked about this. They had this idea of a kinsman redeemer, guardian redeemer. Basically, by law, you couldn't lose your property. If you had to sell it to make money to, to survive, somebody related to you had to buy it back and give it back to you. Yeah. Sound like a good deal? except they never did it because <laughs> what's in it for me, right? So Naomi's like, there's a loophole here. Let's use the guardian redeemer. Now, part of the guardian redeemer, the guardian redeemer was to get the land back, but the other piece was a kinsman redeemer was to preserve the family line, which meant that a widow had to be remarried to get babies. 
so she could have continued the line. So guardian redeemer, kinsman redeemer. Naomi's like, there's a loophole in the law. Who are my people? I used to work in a prison. There's no better lawyers than prisoners. They study the law day and night. They are masters of loopholes. By the way, if you're on the internet and somebody starts selling you a loophole, run the opposite direction. Loopholes work like this. Loopholes will get you hung. Ignore those people. Loopholes are dangerous. But I want to say this is she's like, hey, we, we got this kinsman redeemer thing. Let's figure out a way to trap Boaz. You ever heard an idea? Somebody told you an idea and in your mind goes, that's a bad idea. And God goes, let's do this. What has to die at that point? <laughs> Yourself. So she goes and she does it. She, she lays down next to him and, and he wakes up and he's like, whoa. And he go, she goes, you know, you're my kinsman redeemer. You're my guardian redeemer. Um, please cover me with your cloak. In other words, bring me into your house. Bring me into your protection. Now, stay with me. He could have done that and never done anything more for her. He could have bought the property, given it back to her. But he doesn't do that. And he also doesn't take advantage of the moment. And he says, wait right here. Hold my beer. I'm going. And he goes, and he does this interesting thing. He says, no. He says, if, he says, I'm not going to take advantage of you, Ruth. Because intimacy requires covenant. Come back to that. I'm not going to take advantage of you, but I'm going to find out there's somebody else who has a right to help you first. And he does this little trickery thing. He goes, hey, man, you in front of everybody, hey, you, you're, you're in line to get this property. Now, here's the deal. Ruth and Naomi has no kids, and she's past childbearing. This guy redeems the property when she dies, he gets the property back. He's helping her. Right? Anybody here had somebody help you to help themselves? Right? Let me help you. You're right. Anyway, and so Boaz goes, oh, oh, oh by the way, if you, if you do that, then you have to marry Ruth. Now, here's the reality. The law didn't say that. Because, see, Ruth is not blood relative of Elimelech and Naomi. She's a Moabitess. It's not the law. And by the way, they're not keeping the law anyway. <laughs> like, you, do you realize how many sketchy points in this plan there are? <laughs> if you can figure out a plan of how God's going to do it, that's not how he's going to do it. He's like, watch this. <laughs> like, I can't tell you the number of times, like, the Lord led me through the wilderness. And it's like. And I look back and I was like, if I had to walk that tightrope, I'd die. Right? Because if I knew, because it's just this still small voice saying, this is the way, walk in it. This is the way, walk in it. Who, who here, you want to get the plan from God and not talk to him until it's done? I want some guarantees. Yeah, here's his guarantee. He does give guarantees. I will be with you. <laughs> if you did not hear the exhaustion, the, ex the moan from Masha, right? That's his promise. I'll be with you. I will be your great and ever present, you know, help. I will be your defender. I'll be your reward. I'll be your inheritance. You're like, can I convert that to cash? <laughs> but what happens is it works. It shouldn't have worked. But he called this guy's bluff and he said, dude, oh, if you want the land, you got to take Ruth, the Moabitess. And he realizes, oh, then she become, her kids become my heirs. I pay for all this property. I don't get anything out of it. Nah. But see, Boaz, God knew that Boaz was for Ruth. Yes. Ruth didn't know Boaz existed when she came with Naomi. Boaz was not going to walk in his destiny without Naomi and without Ruth. 
Ruth wasn't going to walk in her destiny without Naomi and without Boaz. Naomi wasn't going to walk in her destiny without Ruth and without Boaz. Where two or three are gathered, there I am in the midst. But you know what that midst is? It's loving kindness. It is grace. And this is what undergirds the concept of covenant. Now, I'm just going to take a little side track. Tra- By the way, we're going to end up at Palm Sunday in just a hop, skip, and a jump. So when I showed you the path, that's the path. <laughs> covenant. Now, I've heard people talk about my covenant rights. If you say covenant rights, you don't understand covenant. That's right. Because you know the only covenant right you have? To die. Come on. That's literally the only right in a covenant. See, in the ancient world, when they were going to make an agreement between a king and his people, they would do a covenant. And a covenant would, they take all these animals and they cut them right down the middle. Big old ugly animals. You ever been to a slaughterhouse? You know, but no buzz saw it, so it takes a while. And so imagine these gory messes on either side. And then what would happen is they would have to walk in between them and say their promises while they're doing it. Basically saying, if I don't keep my promises, then this is what will happen to me. But guess what? In the ancient world, guess who made the promises? The people made the promises, and the king took them. Basically, the king said, oh, you want me to be king? Fine. Or he would capture people. He would dominate people. He'd take over country. He'd say, okay, now we're doing a covenant. All right, yeah, I'm going to help you out. I'm going to be your king. But if you don't obey me completely, I'm going to kill you. We cool? covenant we see God do over and over again in scripture. We see it in chapter 15 of Genesis with Abram. He, God, says, God, a, God says, I'm going to bless you, Abram. I'm going to make your people great. It's going to be incredible. And Abram's like, hey, I'm, um, you know, I'm about 75, 80 years old here. I have no kids. How that, how's that going to happen? How can I know it will happen? And God said, watch this. And God said, cut all those animals in half. And Abram knows what's coming. This is going to be bad. What do I have to give God to get what I want? Right? It's, it's transactional. And so what God does, God says he put him to sleep. Bonk! Remember the last time he put somebody to sleep? Adam. Yes. Out comes Eve. Yes. Puts him to sleep and God walks between the pieces. He says, oh, but you want to know, Abram, if you can trust me to be good? Because if I don't keep my word, this is what will happen to me. And God actually takes Abram's side of the covenant and his own. See, a lot of the places where we got this idea that covenants are transactional is you get the blessings and curses in Deuteronomy. You know why they're there? Because the people had an opportunity to live with God with just the Ten Commandments in relationship. That whole, I am with you, listen to my voice. And they said, we don't want that. You're scary. We think you're out to get us. We think you're like one of those kings. We want a rule book, just like the kings give. God says, you want a rule book? Here's the rule book. See, if you have covenant rights, you're living transactionally. You're not living in Hesed. Yeah. See, Hesed, it says, the greater serves the lesser. That's right. The greater. This is why he, Jesus said, this is how you shall pray, our Father who is in heaven. Do you know what a father does from the first moment of their child's life? He doesn't ask anything of the child, does he? He serves. He cares for. He ministers. Now, this is the miracle of being the body, though. Paul says, husbands and wives submit to each other. So which one of us is greater? Depends on the day. (laughs) True? Oh, you're the DD today. Okay. Right? The one who has Hesed serves the other. Well, now your turn. Just depends. 
Just depends. In the body of Christ, we serve one another with this self-giving love. This self-giving love says, I have more. I bless you. I serve you. I don't, it's not transactional. I'm not taking from you. I'm loving you. I'm serving you. I'm caring for you. And the ultimate evidence of this, Jesus said, no greater love, no greater hesed has any man than to lay down his life for his friends. And this is what we see on Palm Sunday. It said that Jesus was up on the Mount of Transfiguration. And he met with Elijah and with Moses. And it said he shone like one, white like wool, whiter than any bleach could make his clothes. And he was, when he came down, he said his face was set like flint. I'm heading to Jerusalem to do what? To win back what was taken. See, you got to understand. See, God uses metaphor like father. God is a father, but we're not his biological heirs. Does that make sense? God, God uses metaphors not because they're 100% accurate, but rather that they're a good starting point. But every time he gives us a metaphor from the world, he flips it on its head, just like he did with the covenant, right? In the covenant, the king uses and abuses the people. In God's covenant, the king gives himself for the people, right? It's the king who dies, not the people. And so every time, so he's using this covenantal language and he says, I, you need, the reason I use metaphors is to explain what's really going on behind the scenes. And Brian asked me a great question a while back about what does the atonement look like? I don't remember the exact question, but I'll, um, so if I mess this up, it's not his fault. But let me say this. See, God created cause and effect. I've mentioned this before. The way, if I let this go, what is going to happen to it? Every single one of you knew what was going to happen. Why? Because cause and effect works, right? It works all the time. And that's so important because if we didn't have cause and effect, my choices would be meaningless, right? What if I'm like, I let it go and my intention is for it to fall down and it flies up. Well, then I'm not in control. I don't really have free will. I don't have a choice. And if I don't have a choice, I'm not a person. I'm not made in the image of God. And I'm not able to love and have a relationship with God. And that's why he came to give us, to make us human, to be, make us able to have communion with each other and with God. That's the whole point. And so for that to stay in pass, our cause and effect has to happen. But we talked about this before. Who here has done something you didn't end up paying for. Anybody here? Okay. Blink twice if you've committed a crime and you haven't done the time. All right. Okay, good. There are a few honest people. All right. Like literally, literally, like, like I stole cookies for years in my house and never got caught. Right? Here's the deal, though. When cause, when a, when a, when a cause, the effect doesn't come to pass, what happens to it? It has to go somewhere. Or the universe doesn't work. This, our choices are meaningless. And this is what God meant when he said, if you break relationship, there's a cost to be paid. Yeah. Anybody here had something happen where somebody violated your trust? Yeah. And you couldn't go forward with the relationship, could you? Until there's restoration. Right? And restoration is going to be what? Painful. There's going to be a death, isn't there? Maybe you've done something. You violated the relationship and you realize the only way to get it back was for you to do what? Confess. Admit I was wrong. Go low. Die. But all of this death, there's a bigger death at stake because there's much worse things. And that's why he went. He said, I'm going to the cross to take the effect of everyone's choices so that you can come to the Father, that you can can come back to relationship with each other. And so when he's coming into Jerusalem, they cry out to him. They say, Hosanna, 
Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna was what they were shouting for the victorious king. That was the, that was the victory cry for the victorious king. That was Hosanna, Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. It was the sign. You are the Messiah. Nobody knew what he was there to do. But he said, I'm, I have come to get my own back. And he went and he went to the cross. He wasn't a victim. He went and he said, I will take what the results, the consequences of what y'all have done. I've said this before. Anybody here know somebody who's been running from the consequences of their choices their whole life? Those consequences are catching up with you, aren't they? But I think of it like this. It's like a rubber band. When there are consequences that I'm running for from, eventually the band has to snap back, doesn't it? Jesus sticks his hand in between and takes the blow that was meant for me. Not by God, but by the world that he designed to keep us the people. And so, I feel like each of us has places in our life where we're running from consequences of choices. Um, one way I like to say it is when you're trying to have your cake and eat it too. Anybody? Where, where you're trying to... Um, um, get fixed so you can come out to have relationship that you're only going to get fixed by being in relationship. Figure out a way not to actually have to own up to what you've done. Not own up to maybe this is my mess. Maybe there's a different story. I don't know what it is, but I don't, I think maybe my story I've been telling myself to justify myself is not true. Maybe I'm not the victim I thought I was. Maybe in some relationships, I'm the villain. I don't know what it is for you where you're afraid of that snapping back. Maybe it's just this vague miasma, this cloud of doubt and fear. You don't even know where it's coming from. I want to say, bring it to the foot of the cross. But you need to understand, Paul told us, he said, in Christ, we have died. Mm -hmm. See, we only enter into Christ's death by our death. Yes. God, I can't. Mm -hmm. I'm terrified to face what, to face my fears, to face the possibility of my own faults, my own failings, my own sins, my own screwed upness of the of a story that's not the one I tell myself but God I'm done I can't where I have died my life is hidden with Christ in God and it's no longer I who live but Christ who lives in me because when I let him be my sacrifice when I step into his death when I let him speak his truth over me, suddenly it's his life that flows into me and I begin to live. He empowers me to clean up messes. He empowers me to stand in the truth and not die. He empowers me to confess. He empowers me to be bold and show up in relationship. He empowers me to be who I was always made to be but was afraid to be. no matter the consequence. This is why he came. And that's why the people said, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And so today, he's coming to each of our hearts. We could have the worship team come.
I don't know what it is for you. I, I know what it is for me. He's been putting his finger on such areas of unforgiveness in my heart this week. <laughs> what part of death is saying, I'm not going to control the agenda, Lord. You, what David said, oh God, search my heart. If there be any wicked way in me, yes. point it out. Not me. I, I trust you, Father. I'm not going to hide. I'm not going to use the fig leaves of Adam and Eve. I'm not going to cover up. I'm going to say, God, have your way today in me. If we can stand as we go into worship. If you're willing to belly up to that bar, to come up to the cross and say, God, not my way anymore. I'm done with excuses. I'm done with the stories. I'm done with the lies. I'm done with the blaming. I just want you and your life. I come to die today. This altar is open. I feel like this is an altar call moment. If you are in that space where you're like, I can't anymore, Jesus. I'm giving everything to you. I'm just surrendering. This altar is open. Just come and lay yourself down. <laughs> lay yourself down and find him better than you thought he is. Find him better. Buy, find his kindness better than you ever could know. Find his restoration. Find his life. As you die, as I die, as we lay down our own efforts, as we lay down our own attempts to cover ourselves up, to clean ourselves up, to fix ourselves, to, I don't know, just do all of this. Ah! And we just, some of us are hanging on to the point our fingers are bleeding, but we can't. And there's an invitation to just let go and fall into Him. Fall into Him. Die and be resurrected. Jesus, thank you that you are turning our graves into gardens. Thank you, Jesus, that as we put ourselves on the altar, the fire of God comes down and sets us aflame, and then we actually feel alive. Yeah, I just feel like Peter's shirt is prophetic with the sail. <laughs> I saw so many of us just trying to row our boat, and it's not going anywhere. But just putting our um, rowers up, uh, oars down and just setting ourselves into the wind and the wind just picking us up and carrying us like that sailboat. <laughs> There's a lot of wind. So Jesus, we just thank you, Lord, that you are coming behind us, that as we surrender, as we let go of our own effort, you come in and just propel us. This is the word I feel is you are propelled into purposes and destiny. You are propelled into your dreams. You are propelled into the desires that he's had for you from the creation of the universe. You are propelled as you lay down. You are propelled as you trust. You are propelled as you just let go. Ah, Jesus, thank you, Lord, that as, as individuals and as a body, Father, we just ask you, if we lay down our own understanding, our efforts, and we ask you to propel us into your purpose. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, amen, amen, amen. For more information, go to arisenlife.org or follow us on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram.